General Assembly, which is the middle of June, and then we'll be looking at picking up with Ephesians 1 at uh, if and when the Lord brings me back. So, <laughs> depends on what happens in Birmingham, folk. <laughs> so, um, anyway, uh, that's where we're headed. So, these marvelous words that we're reading today uh, have inspired many throughout the years and also filled uh, some with dread and apprehension, as they should. So I would ask if you would please stand as we read Revelation 20, verses 7 through 13, and the sermon title today is Saved by Grace, Judged by Works. Now when the thousand years had expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God and of heaven and devoured them, out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And may the Lord add his blessings to the reading and understanding that comes from his word. Please be seated. I usually start off by asking a question, and today is no different. And I'm going to pause for just a second after I ask it, just to let it kind of sink in and see if you have ever really considered this. And here's the question. What difference would it make in your life if you were absolutely sure that what you were doing in this life was eternally important. Have you ever pondered that? In other words, with all of the big stuff going on in the world around us, we can feel, you know, generally small and insignificant. Not the way that we act that way. We act like we're the most important people on the earth. But the, the bottom line is that when we sit back and think about it, you know, whether I get up and go to church this morning or whether I go out to the grocery store on Tuesday or, or this, that, or the other, uh, the thought process is, you know, who cares? What difference does it make? Uh, yet somehow, what would it mean if you spent your waking moments in such a way that it was vitally important. One of the most plainly taught teachings in scripture is that it is. Perhaps the most beloved feature of the gospel of Jesus Christ as it applies to each one of us individually and personally is that we are saved by grace and not of works. Paul plainly teaches this. It's our great comfort. It is our great assurance. He taught us that before eternity was, our triune God chose to save us. When we were yet sinners, he sent his son into the world to save us, to die for us. Our sins have been canceled out by the atoning work that he did on our behalf. Now, yes and amen. Uh, before Jacob or Esau had ever been born and done anything good or evil, God loved Jacob and chose him specifically. 
And God did this, as it says, Paul says right there in Romans in this same passage, God did this so that the purpose of God would stand on the basis of election. In other words, on the basis of God's prior intent to show grace. That is our hope of salvation. And it is our only hope of salvation. But it's also plainly taught in Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament, as you heard from the book of Daniel read this morning, that when we stand before God, our lives are going to be reviewed. <laughs> you know? We will give account of all of the works we've done in the flesh. Here's Jeremiah on the subject in chapter 17. I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Hmm. Now, Jesus himself plainly spoke about this. I, the Lord, search the heart. Oh, that's already done. I'm not sure why that was in there, but in Matthew 12... Jesus said that every man will give account for the words that come from his mouth. And then Paul in 2 Corinthians says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one of us may receive the things done in the body according to what he has, what he has done, whether good or bad. Okay? There are just some teachings, those are just some teachings that we find in Scripture. And they should get our attention. Every second of life that we walk on this earth is a gift of God. The older we get, the more we understand that. And God has intended for us to take those breaths and to have those heartbeats and to walk before him in such a way as to achieve his purposes in our lives. And one day we're all going to stand before him and hear how we used those precious moments and hours. Now for some this is a terrifying event. For all of us it is one that's kind of shaky. But for some it is terrifying. It's a solemn reminder of how much we need God's grace. For some of us, it will be a cause of rejoicing, as Christ says, I was there with you, and this is the fruit that I brought forth as I walked with you through your life. Now, the point is this. We should take stock of our lives every day and throughout our days. And we should understand that we are living before God and he is going to hold us account for how we spend those days and moments and hours. In other words, we are saved by grace, but we're judged by works. Let's step back a little bit and look at this passage and look at its main points. As we look at it, it's obviously divided up into two sections. We don't know great rocket science there. Verses 7 through 10 have to do with that great battle we call Armageddon. But notice the shift in how Revelation is written at this point. This is the first time we see something like this. It starts out with a definite shift in time, when the thousand years have passed. Now we, like I said, haven't really seen anything like this before. The thousand year millennium, of which we spoke last week, I'm sure you remember it, However, we take that symbolizes a long period of time. But this verse clearly teaches us that that long period of time does not go on forever. However we understand it, whether you're an all mill, a post mill, a pre mill, or a I don't know mill. It's, you understand that there is a point in time when that which is identified as the millennium comes to an end. Now, prior to that, coming to an end, as we spoke last week, 
God has restrained Satan and has not given him the full reign over the earth that he had uh, before. Although we have seen, yea and amen, he's able to wreak havoc, yet at the same time, he is restrained. An example of this is Job. You remember how in the second chapter of Job that Satan appears before God and Job says, and God says, consider my servant Job, and they go through that dialogue. And, and God increasingly unleashes Satan and it gives him more and more freedom, but he, got, he, he hinges one thing. He says, you cannot take his life. See, Satan, even in his worst moments, has to acknowledge that God is all-powerful and has authority over him. Satan was allowed, has been allowed to afflict the earth and God's people on it, but it is only for a set time. There will come a day when the thousand years are over. Now at, that, at the end of that time, as we read here, Satan is allowed again to go out and deceive the nations. In other words, he's going to be unleashed from whatever it was that kept him from being able to make all of these things happen. And so as a result of that, we see he is able to gather, to gather these various nations for this final great battle. Now what is he doing? He's filling the, the world's imagination with a picture of how great it would be on this earth if we could just get rid of those pesky Christians. And he paints a glorious picture. But if, if these Christians are painted as being the ones that are preventing mankind from going out and achieving its fullest potential, they're, they're people who keep teaching that we should live under the idea that there's a God in heaven who cares for us. What a ridiculous thing. But the more he does that, the more he is able to deceive the nations, the more angry the nations grow at his instigation. And so they gather together to go to war against God's people. Now, when we see that here, they gather up their spiritual and physical weapons, and then looking at verse 8, we see that they surround the fortified camp of the saints. And their numbers are as large as the sand of the sea, as many as the sand of the sea. That word fortified camp there, I've, I intentionally amplified it because it brings to mind the camp that was set up in the wilderness travels of Israel because that's what they did. They stopped in their travels and they would stay for a while and they would camp. They'd put up the, the uh, walls around the camp. They'd put post guards and all of this. And of course, the, the uh, idea of being outside the camp means that you're exposed to evil. Well, that's what the picture is here. The, the, the saints are pictured as being encamped in the fortified camp. It's wartime, and the peoples of the nations are gathered around them. But also, there's an important statement here that he says that it's not only the fortified camp, but also the beloved city. And that beloved city is kind of a unique thing here because the great city has been talked about with Babylon, and the beloved city, which we will see in the next chapter coming down from heaven, is what's in uh, view. So you have uh, two pictures here of the, of the people of God. You've got them as they exist on earth, completely surrounded by their enemies, somewhat apprehensive about where this is headed. And then you have a picture that is how God sees them, the beloved city his Jerusalem, his Zion, and he's not going to let it ever be completely lost. Now, when the people gather there, we will note in passing that they're gathered under the names of Gog and Magog. Now, various folks have written some fairly wild books about who's Gog and where's Magog and all of this business. And um, the late, late great planet Earth sold billions of copies. 
And of course, it was Russia coming down into Israel and, and there's all kinds of battles going on. Well, the reason why this thing is talked about here, Gog and Magog, is that there is only one other passage in all of scripture where those names are mentioned. It's not like throughout all of the chapters of scripture, God is hitting us over the head with this Gog and Magog people. The only place you're ever gonna find them is Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now, why is it that that is being brought on here? Let's dwell on that for a moment. We need to understand how God uses his scripture. I'll take us back to the cross. Jesus, there on the cross, cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, he's specifically pointing back to a passage. He's pointing back to Psalm 22. And he's saying to all who read those words and all who sat around and heard those words that day, he's saying, if you want to know what's happening to me, read that psalm. That psalm of David. So it was a reference. It was a bookmark. And when we do read it, it clearly opens up to us what an astonishing thing the cross was. Now this reference of Gog and Magog, I'm convinced, is the same thing. Jesus doesn't, in this revelation, go into great detail about this final battle. As a matter of fact, he says they, you know, they gathered and encamped against the saints. God came along and said, not on your life. Boosh, you know, dumps fire on top of them and they're done. That's about the whole uh, story of, of this battle. But what is he saying? He's not giving great details. But he says, go back and look at Ezekiel 38 and 39, and you will see it there. And you will see an extensive development of the final battle. And it is so closely paralleled to what has happened here. You see how clearly God is using his word to help us understand what's happening. And Ezekiel says this. There will be a final battle against God, and the people of God will be surrounded and helpless against odds, and God's people don't have enough arms and people to defeat the enemy, so God does it himself with all manner of evils, including plagues and fire. So it's the same story, and we see God raining down fire on his enemies. Another picture of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, in which God defeated the evil people of the world by bringing fire down from heaven and it also reminds us of Elijah's sacrifice when his um, uh, offering was consumed by fire coming down from heaven. The point is this. It's a simple point. This battle of the last day is the culmination of all the previous battles that God has fought throughout history. Only on this day, this definite day, at the end of the thousand years, God will say, that's enough. I am done with this. And then he will bring Satan and all of his followers, and he will cast them into the lake of fire, along with the beast and the false prophet. And notice something, brothers and sisters. Look at the passage. It says they will be tormented forever and ever. Now, I want you to take that to heart. They will be what? That's not fun, right? It's talking about infliction of serious discomfort. And how long will they be tormented? That means in some way that we don't understand, there will be an enduring of torment. Do not be deceived by those who sometimes go around claiming the title of Christian and some of whom speak from pulpits who stand before you and say, God is too good and too loving to send anybody to hell. 
I once had a grand old man, I loved him dearly. I was uh, in a Presbyterian church up in Pennsylvania. He was Dr. Robert Swain, since gone. Uh, he was head of the Department of uh, Philosophy and Theology at Beaver College. And at the, in those days, he was ancient. I mean, he must have been 65 or 70. You know? <laughs> and I was in there, I was uh, stationed at the Naval Air Development Center at Warminster, Pennsylvania. We started going to this little church. And this man was the one true uh, pacifist I have ever known. He's the only one, a true pacifist. He, out of conviction, believed that there was no cause in which a Christian should ever fight. And he opposed the entry of, of the United States into World War II and all of those kind of things. So he was a, a liberal of the most extreme persuasion, the only man I've ever met, on principle, who'd do that. But he stood in the pulpit one day, and he was trained in the uh, philosophic arts, and so his, uh, pre his preaching was very academic and high level. And he said, well, you know, people ask me sometime if there really is such a thing as hell. And I am here to tell you, yes, there is. And then he paused, and he said, but only a fool would believe there's anybody in it. And this grand old man that I love very dearly was just as wrong as he could be. Yes, I told him that. <laughs> he laughed. He loved me anyway. But the bottom line of it is, brothers and sisters, there's, there are people in this world that just think that it's a contradiction in terms for God to be loving and kind and gracious and merciful and still send people to hell. Well, we might think that way if God's word didn't say otherwise, and it does. And therefore, we must embrace it. If we ever come to the point to where we say God is too good to punish sin forever, we have just invalidated the word of God as the word of God. We can no longer say it is inerrant and infallible because it is plainly taught that he punishes sin forever. Amen? Well, let's look at the sex, second section. Verse 11 through 15 focus on the last judgment, which coincides with and immediately follows the Battle of Armageddon. Now, immediately our attention here is drawn to the great white throne. Now, we've seen thrones set up before. We talked about them a few weeks, uh, last week actually, in verse 4 of this chapter. And we saw thrones being set up for people to judge the nations. But brothers and sisters, this is different. This is the throne. It takes us all the way back to chapter 4. There we had another view of our almighty, all-knowing, all-creating, all-sovereign God seated on it. There he was surrounded by his creation. He, and they were all singing and praising him. At his feet was the sea of glass, <coughs> which we discussed as being history itself, which is transparent to his view. And he was pictured there as overseeing and uh, ruling over the universe in terms of the progress of history as it works out before him. And always he is directing the force and the flow of history to a definite end. There is an ultimate purpose for which history is directed. Now this that we're reading about today, brothers and sisters, on this glorious day, is that end towards which all things are directed. It is the purpose for which God sent his son into the world to atone for our sins. It is the reason why we have seen a picture of Jesus riding throughout the world on his white horse, slaying the nations with the word of uh, the sword of the gospel coming out of his mouth. Jesus once told his disciples, that he had longed for the day 
He had anxiously had looked forward to the day when he would celebrate that last supper with them. <coughs> but then, as he went through that meal, he told them that he would not again drink of the fruit of the vine until he drank it new in the kingdom of God. Do you see how even there, before his, before his agony on the cross, our Lord was looking through that Passover meal. And he was looking to that great day when he would again be with his people and drinking the wine fresh at that day. And what was that day? It was the day when the great white throne would be set up. It was the day when evil in this world would be judged and punished and the people of God would no longer be subject to Satan's torments. Now the picture we see here painted in this passage is one of inexpressible magnificence. It is intended to awe and to intimidate and it does. If you let this picture that we see here fill your mind, all the multitudes of the earth gathered and in the center is this magnificent white throne with our God sitting on it and all of his servants, all of his angels and, and all of that are, are shouting and singing at the background. What a day. Now, we will speak more about this when we get into the next chapter. But right now, realize that when the day of judgment comes, history as we know it will be over. There will be a new day. Here it says that the earth and the heavens fled away. Now, that means that the earth as we know it will be changed. It will still be the earth. And just like our bodies whom are resurrected will still be our fleshly bodies, but they will be different. And so will our earth. Because the realm of the unseen creation, which has separated us from them, we talked about this very early on in Revelation, that, that we are surrounded by another sphere of creation, the spiritual, and that will no longer be in place. And that's what it means that the heavens and the earth uh, were, uh, were dismissed. So that all of the angels, all of the creation, all of the spiritual creation will be open to our eyes even as we are able to see them. All around us will be amazed. We will be amazed at all around us on that scene. We'll talk about this more in the coming weeks. But now we come to the main point of the entire passage. The purpose of history as we know it, the reason why the white throne is set up is unto the end that God will be glorified by sitting and judging everyone who has lived in history. God will be glorified by sitting and judging everyone who has lived in history. Now, we're probably at that point when we hear that, we're kind of a little bit taken back. And it says more about us than about God if that sounds somehow disappointing. We somehow think that it must be beneath God to be anything but tender and loving. And why is that? It's because we just don't hold justice as high in regard as we should. The culture has convinced us, we see it every day, that the punishment of crimes dehumanizes both the criminal who is being punished and the ones who are afflicting him with the punishment. And since we are all subjected to sin and temptation, that may be true in some instances. There may be those who inflict punishment on others and get sinful enjoyment out of it. They are despicable in that and will be called to account for it. But brothers and sisters, God is not like that. He is the God of justice. Sin and evil are a direct insult to his majesty. Sin and evil are grounded in human impudence, arrogance, 
and spite. And the worst sins and the worst sins are acts of depravity, some of which acts of depravity come close to being pure evil. Peyton Gendron, someone you've heard about in recent weeks, he's the guy that shot up Buffalo a few weeks back. And unlike the shooter in Texas, he lived through it. He's going to face trial. Now, barring any surprises, he will be found guilty of mass murder. Now, brothers and sisters, can anyone in this room believe that imprisoning him for life is a just punishment for his crime? Doesn't something deep inside of us say, that's not enough? His life should be forfeit for his senseless killing of others. Oh, I've heard the other statements. Well, you know, it's worse to be punished by being stuck in jail for the rest of your life than to be killed. Name me one guy on death row that would agree with that. No. Justice declares that there should be a, fun, a punishment equivalent to the crime. Consider this now, after we've looked at that horrible thing and we think to ourselves, gosh, I'm so glad I'm not like that guy. Now consider this. The Bible teaches us that if we break one single commandment, we've broken them all. That's James 2. In other words, just as Jesus said, if we lust in our heart, we have committed adultery. And further, that if we have hated and despised another individual in our heart, we have committed murder. Now, brothers and sisters, apart from the saving work of Jesus Christ and the cleansing work of the Holy Spirit, we would all stand before Christ on the last day, the great judge, and be every bit as guilty as that guy in Buffalo. Do you believe that? And not only would be as guilty, we would admit we were. Eternal, just, eternal death would be the just deserts for our sin. God is glorified in judgment. And in this very way is he glorified. Every soul that appears before him will confess their sin. All of us on our day, on that day, will have our history brought out into the open. We will know as we are known right down to the last detail. And all of those whose names are not written in the book of life will hear that nothing they did in this life will count for any good. The Bible says that everything done apart from faith is sin. Everything that is not done from faith is sin. No matter how many marches we are in to get abortion canceled, or how much money we give to the poor, or any kind of thing, if it's done apart from faith, the word that the Bible applies to those acts are sin. So, when we look at that, unbelievers being apart from faith will not have one single item in their life that sends for their credit. Their life record will count for no good. And what else could God do to them, do for them? They spent their whole life sinning. Every day, every waking moment, every breath they took. What else could God do for them but fitly give them the justice their sin deserves? Now, what about those of us whose names are in the book of life? Well, it plainly teaches our lives are going to be reviewed also. And to our horror, as we contemplate it now, we will discover that we're far greater sinners than we thought we were. 
we will discover sins in our life that we passed over in our minds. But as each sin in our life is brought forth before the, tri- before the God seated on the throne, our big brother, our advocate, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ of God, will proclaim, I paid for that. I paid for that sin. Every one of them. It was nailed to my cross, and the stain of that sin has been removed from this brother or sister. Then, amazingly enough, we'll hear other stuff. We'll hear about good works that we did. Each one was done through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. But it's counted to our credit. We know from, apart from the Spirit, we can do no good thing, but through the Spirit, we can and we must do good works. And as our lives are reviewed, we will be amazed by the verdict. We have no sins counted against us. But there are good works that are counted for us. Perhaps it was giving a cup of water in the name of Jesus, who he himself said, if it's done, will not fail to receive its reward. The ledger for our lives will be overbalanced. There will be no sins against us, but there will be good works that are held to our credit. I can imagine Satan standing there shaking in rage. It's not fair. He sinned far more than he did good works. And I can imagine my Savior, if you're here today and you belong to Jesus Christ, your Savior, I can imagine my Savior standing up and saying, that's grace, Satan. Now be gone to the lake of fire. We are saved by grace. We are judged by works. I have one last short comment to answer for a question that may be arising in your mind, even as I say this. These good works that I do does that make my salvation based on those good works as some so-called Christian denominations teach? No. As Jesus and Paul specifically taught us, salvation is by God's gracious choice entirely. It is a gift of God transmitted to us via faith and good works do not gain us admission into heaven. Good works in God's justice determine the reward we receive having been admitted to heaven through faith. We are not rewarded with salvation. Anybody that says that God rewards us with salvation because we have faith is turning faith into a work. That's not true. So we're not rewarded with salvation. We are saved by Christ unto the end of receiving a reward. And all that, how all that is going to work out is entirely the business of our God sitting on that white throne. But take it to the bank. No one who will receive a reward will be disappointed. And no one will be jealous of what some other person received as their reward. Great is your reward in heaven, Jesus told those who would die for the faith. And so shall he say to all of us whose names are written in the book of life that he will give to each of us according to our deeds on earth as he says precisely here in verse 14. Here ends the word of God for today. Let's pray. Lord and God, this is serious stuff. And though the tension of what is taught 
can be alleviated a little bit by some degree of thought, even a glancing bit of humor. Yet, Lord God, the seriousness of it is no laughing matter. We have a God of such magnificent proportion that he is able to save us by grace and judge us by works. This is our God. It's who you are. And Lord God, we thank you that we stand as those who by faith have been admitted into your kingdom and who through faith can claim that our names are written in the book of life. What an amazing thing you have done for us. Thank you, our Lord and God, for all that you do. We ask that you bless us to the consideration of these things, for we ask it in your name. Amen. Please stand as we sing our closing hymn.